from the oldest city in the USA, St. Augustine tonight, with our guest, Annette Danielson, Chris Bador, and musical guest, Billy Buchanan, and your host, Harry Rivera. That's right. We're back. We're back. We are back in one of the coolest places here in town, the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center. And slowly it's becoming more of a cultural center than a museum. I don't know. This place is getting really, really good. And, and, uh, we love it. Um, uh, this is our second show here. We're going to have one more show here at the uh, Lincolnville Museum. Uh, it, the venue, I'm really going to miss this venue. This venue is just spectacular. So I really want to thank uh, Floyd, Philip, and Gail uh, for being so, so, so generous when I brought up the idea. You know, I'd like to do one of the shows. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were in right away. And then so many others. Um, after here, we will be at the St. Augustine Distillery, the Art Association, and many places around town. So follow us on Facebook. Um, just, just Google St. Augustine Tonight Show, and you'll find lots of information. Another thing is, you know, this, this week, California. Oh, my Lord, did you see? You know, it's like um, you live in these beautiful neighborhoods, and you never think that a fire of that intensity, that madness, is really going to come in. Just take the whole city. Um, it was really, it reminded me of the, the old black and white films of those firestorms during the war, you know, when they'd bomb these cities. It's, uh, it's heartbreaking. So our prayers go out to them and so many people who are still recovering from the storm. The other day I, I, I went in a, in a bar. Uh, yes, I do drink once in a while. <laughs> take the edge off this show. But um, I walked in a bar and I don't know, I got all nostalgic. I guess for the simple reason is that bars are not what they used to be when I was in my early 20s because bars were a place where you'd go in and they were very quiet. And you'd go in and I usually, you know, at 23, I'd ask for a chaser, which was a Schlitz beer and a little Johnny Walker Red. And it was very quiet. And maybe if there was music, it was quite subtle. And um, you'd meet someone, have a conversation. Uh, if you were very lonely, you'd you talk to the bartender. I mean, Frank Sinatra has a song like that. <laughs> it's two o'clock at nine, you know. And he's talking to the bartender. And uh, I admit, it was called Joe's Bar and Grill, you know, <laughs> or just something else. Now you go in a bar, and it looks like you're at Best Buy's TV department. I mean, there's 15 televisions. You close your eyes because you don't want to have an epileptic seizure. Uh, there's, just, there's so much going on. And I'm like, you know, and it's loud, and people moving fast, and and there's this going here, this going here, this going here. And uh, I don't stay very long because I, I find it, um, I guess my mind finds it a little bit too, too noisy. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to go to a place where I could just have a nice little drink like an English gentleman and talk to you something and just, just retreat back. Um, something talking about bars, you know, something that'll sober you up very quick is um, I saw this thing at MIT, the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And what it is, it looks like a shiny piece of paper. And what it is, um, is you know what origami is, yes? yes? It's a Japanese taking paper and they make all, they make little birds, they make all things. Well, this thing is, a, they call it an origami bot, meaning an origami robot. And what it does when it's activated, it folds itself into different things. <laughs> it's small enough, this is where you get the kick out of this, where you can swallow it like a pill. It will go somewhere in your body, turn into what it needs to do to do internal surgery inside of you. And there, this is just the beginning, and I was seeing the video of them activating it, and it just like a chameleon, just changing into all these things and moving about on this table. I said, oh my Lord, you know, one day, would, you know, you won't have to really go to surgery. They'll say, just drink this down with a glass of water and it'll take care of that. And the other cool thing I saw, this was the coolest. This is a little device, it's not out in the market yet, but they're experimenting with it, I think also from MIT. What it is, it turns whatever you have in your hand into a remote control. So if you have a mug and you're watching TV and you do this, it'll change the channels for you. 
if you do this, the volume will go up or the volume will go down. I mean, I was watching this guy with his mug drinking coffee, going like that, and the channels were changing, and then he went like that, and you saw the volume bar go up. You could turn anything, and what it, the way it works is there's a camera that is linked to the device you want to control, and it's looking at what device you want to use as the control remote. So it knows by the motions you make what it's going to do to that device. I think that is incredible. And talking about devices, our guests are not devices today. We have Annette Danielson tonight. Our second guest is Chris Vador. And our third, our musical guest is Billy Buchanan and the Rock and Soul Review. Oh! So we're going to take a little break for messages. And when I come back, we're going to have a little bit of Billy Buchanan and the Rock and Soul Review to rock the house. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Carla Wagner. I am the owner of what we call in the hood, the Triple C's, and that stands for the Corazon Cinema and Cafe here located at 36 Granada Street. And how many theaters you got in that lovely place? Oh, you haven't been to the Corazon? You need to come on out and see. Come on out. This is one, and this is Theater Two. Last but not least, Theater Three. So what kind of movies do you run here? Oh, we have a variety of different movies. We have classical, foreign, documentaries, you name it, we carry it. We're an art house, so we have a lot of different movies. That's right, you're an art house. Well, I gotta say, I like the way Triple C rolls. Yeah, that's Chaplin, love him. So, you can come here to socialize, you can come here for a great film, or you can come here and have a bite to eat, too. So come and see us. Salud. Salud. I like this place. Oh, and by the way, we have a valued commodity, and that's lots of parking.
At Martinez & Associates, we can help you with many things. Number one is income for life throughout your retirement, which is very important. Number two would be Medicare choices, which are very confusing. Number three is a legacy for your loved ones. And finally, keeping you independent throughout retirement. My name is Tuli Martinez. Call this number. Y hablamos español. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, we are once again in this wonderful venue, the Lincoln Museum and Cultural Center with Annette Danielson. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who don't know her, she's the person behind SACSPA, which means, stands for? St. Augustine Community School of Performing Arts. Okay, and we'll get back to that soon, but we want to know a little bit about you. And uh, I guess we'd want to start, well, what's the community you grew up in? What, what was home when you were growing up as a child? Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia, full of history, another very rich state, one of our 13 colonies. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And your childhood, was it a good childhood? It was a great childhood. Mm -hmm. I say my mom has the award for praise. <laughs> she always told me I could do it, mm -hmm. no matter what. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, the other question, I would, did anyone in your family was musically inclined? You were growing up? Was there music around the house? There was. Um, all of my uncles uh, played instruments. My granddad uh, played the harmonica. And on the weekends, on Friday nights, we would go to the chicken house mm -hmm. and gospel jamboree singing and playing music. It was great fun. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. It must be. I always envy people who had so much music around them, you know, or uh, parents uh, sang at a church or gospel choirs. I think music is such an essential part of life, and uh, yeah, I always envy people. It's like a great that. bonding for family. Mm, mm. And now, how long have you been here in St. Augustine? I moved here in 2005. Okay. Wow. So you've been here a while now. And when did you start Saxba? 2006. We got our 501c3. All right. And started moving forward with that. Okay. What's the goal yes. of, the, of this? Uh, is it a school? Is it an academy? It is a community outreach. Okay. So our mission is to find and nurture the spirit of creativity and talent that lies within everyone. Okay. And we are not in any particular building. We are in a lot of different buildings. Okay. So we go out into the Boys and Girls Club. We go to St. Augustine Youth Services, to Coquina Crossing, and we try to make it happen, things with musically that aren't happening. Mm. So your alumni can be as young as? We've served three to Till, to, as far as you can three go. To 300. <laughs> three to <laughs> three hundred. I mean, yeah, because people are living longer and longer. Yeah. Our choir at, at Coquina Crossing, they aged 70 and 80 years old mainly. I yes. saw that choir. Uh, what church was it? It was around Christmas time. Moultrie Baptist. Yes. Which is uh, my church. Okay. And I'm the, the pianist there. Oh. Yeah. And so I went there and I saw them and they were excellent. And also in the program, you had all these young people that were playing, and probably it was the first time they were in front of an audience. And they were just absolutely amazing. amazing. It's a lot of fun just coming into an association, a building, and making it happen, teaching them how to sing and play music, and then giving them the opportunity to perform. What do you think yes. is the most challenging thing of working with so many different people, so many different ages? Because you also work with children who have disabilities or, or have yes. challenges. And, yes. I, and those are the ones that really impressed me, how they sat behind a piano and played this lovely tune. So what's your, think, your challenge on that? Well, I, when they finish and they have to move away, mm -hmm. I miss them. Oh, you yeah. make that connection. Yes. You know? yes. So that to me is the hardest thing is saying goodbye. Uh -huh. and they, they, the high schools, a lot of the high schools have programs when they excel and they have their music provided for them when they go there and they have wonderful new opportunities. But, 
They call, they come back, but we visit, but See, I miss them. Because you say you also work at the, the Boys and Girls Club. Yes. And you know, some, so many wonderful artists and musicians have come from that. Denzel Washington, who is one of my favorite actors, and supports that. Very we much. have so much fun at the Boys and Girls Club. And we work with, it could be a 20-member 20, 20 group or 100. Every year we have Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, we have a music mm -hmm. production with, de with Thanksgiving dinner with the children. Mm -hmm. We have Christmas with Santa. And th in, the f in the spring, we have certificates and they graduate. If we have piano classes, we have recorders. Um, we have a whole big bag of recorders. We take them in for everybody. We do choir. <laughs> the famous a lot of fun stuff. Still around. Uh -huh. And now you studied music. You went to school yes. and studied music. What did you major in? I went to Virginia Commonwealth University in okay. Richmond, Virginia, and I was a piano major, performance, and my graduate studies were in piano pedagogy, which is methods in piano teaching. Mm. So I'm like a technique specialist kind right. of thing. And so from the beginning, it was the piano? That was your it was all that? about the piano in the beginning. Really? Yes, it, it, absolutely. What, what was it about the piano? Why wasn't it the guitar? Why wasn't it? I just couldn't stay away from the piano. I started at five years old. I just loved oh, the piano. Wow, you started young. But I loved to sing, and I would sing with the choir at school. Um, I never thought of myself as a soloist, but just as a choir singer. I oh. love singing in the choir. Wow. Well, you were around the. Uh, one time you had an accident. Yes, I sure did. <laughs> and and it, it just, it, it, how did it happen? It changed my plans. Yes. What, yes. what, what was the event? 1998, uh, I had a traumatic brain injury. Um, we, my daughter and I were loading her horse, and the horse bolted, and I got hung up in the rope and pulled across the divider of the trailer and across the field, and I was hung on the rope, and finally I was loosed from the rope. Uh, all four lobes bled. All the vertebrae were broken in my neck. Um, I was paralyzed and lost all long in short-term memory oh, and wow. in and out of a coma. Uh, so, so I'm a miracle. Yeah, God's mean, been good. I mean, yeah. 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 I mean so, so now you come out of this coma and you're, you're starting with an empty box almost. No bad memories. <laughs> get rid of those first. Yeah, no bad we have to start over. Let's get it's rid all of those. All fresh. I all mean, fresh. But I remember you had said you, you, you remembered your address, but you didn't remember your phone number. Isn't that something? I mean, the way the brain. 2403 so New Bern Road, Richmond, Virginia. I grew up with that address. <laughs> well, mine was 1780 Bryant Avenue. It's a little kid in New York. I didn't know my children's names. Oh, wow. But I knew my address, the brain. Wow, isn't that something? Well, the kids aren't. The address is important. Yeah. <laughs> you got to go home at some point. Yeah. I mean, it, it, now it's 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 really it, it's it's yeah, it's crazy. No pun intended. But so now, how long did it take you then? How many oh. years do you think it took you to one day you reach and you said to yourself, "I think I'm operational now." I never thought that. No. I still don't think that. Ah. I'm still recovering. Wow. How long has it been now? Well, 1998. You do the math. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, wow. But even like tonight, when I sat down in the lights, I used to seizure with lights wow. in my eye. And music, too, wasn't it? Yes, I would seizure with music. That's, you sat in so, front of the piano for the first time and... Two years after my injury, my neurologist excused my care and said, this is your permanent recovery, and I hadn't played the piano. I could barely walk at that point. Wow. And um, my dad, I'll tell you a quick story. Yeah, yeah. Go my ahead. dad um, called and he said, I'm going to have a piano. They gave away my piano because we were moving when I had the accident. So there's no, and no, they said, no piano. No point. Well, I was seizure piano. with music. So the All children right. would play in the basement and play their music. I was on the second floor of the house. Yeah. Anyway, my dad said, I'm having a piano delivered to your house. I want you to promise me you'll sit in front of it. Huh. And I said, I can't. It's mm. over, Daddy. But he did, and I did. <laughs> and life continues. The faith yeah. parents have. Huh? Yeah, he was yes. right. Mm -hmm. So when do you think was the first time you actually started saying, let me go ahead and, and take a shot at this one more time? I had a neighbor uh, come to me and say, um, and ask me if she could take me to her house to show me a piano she had just gotten. 
So I went to her house and she said, will you teach my daughter? I said, I don't know how, I can't. <laughs> and she had this little book, a little John Thompson, Earliest Piano Fingers. And she said, well, you just read this book to my daughter. Uh -huh. And she would feed me, she'd, she would drive me over there, just across the street, but I couldn't walk. Right. So she would, she would come and get me and drive me into the park, driveway and get me in the house. <laughs> and I would start reading, I went, quarter note, oh yeah. You know, rest, I remember. Wow. And that, one of my neighbors did that and she's a sweetheart. Wow, and that's how it all started again. It started with that, and another neighbor came over and said, would you play for me to sing Christmas carols? Um, and I said, I can't. And she said, well, let's just try. And then I started that. Oh, wow. It was just baby steps. So they were basically pushing you People there. came along. Uh-huh. Wow. Ain't that something? God put them in my life. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was a blessing. Angel messenger. Come on, yeah. you can do it. You can do it. Yeah. And so now you can play. You I'm, can teach. I, Yes, I play and I teach, and I'm still improving. I haven't done a classical concert like I used to do right. um, professionally, right. but um, I'm working on it. It's and always getting better. So your goal for Saxby was to, to try to get that from people to that they can express themselves musically. Now, do you do other things other than music at this, at this school? Um, we have lots of different things we do because mm -hmm. we bring in volunteers. So if anybody out there wants to volunteer, 904-824-0664 <laughs> and okay. we'll, we'll link you up. We okay. do dance, we do singing, music, instrumental art, mm -hmm. whatever project mm -hmm. with the arts. Mm -hmm. I know your daughter sings, she has a lovely voice. Yes. Yes. And so what do you see the future of sax then? When you look, what do you see? Or what would you like it to be? I would like that after I'm gone that it can continue mm -hmm. and there's funding provided to pay community volunteers, the musicians, yeah. to go into the places that need to be to provide the performing arts where it's not happening. I know. And to perform in the places where it's not happening. So people who can't get out or make those decisions to help that happen, wow. to pay for that. Wow. wow. Well, th do you have any special story that you could share about some child that you can think of? I have my BG story. Uh-huh. Go ahead. I have lots of stories, but uh -huh. okay, so BG came to me, I'll be quick. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> BG came to me with um, a bodyguard and a broken arm, and his mother said, would you please, you know, help him? He loves music, and I know, he, I know it could help him, and I said, oh my goodness, I don't know, and he was very angry, and um, a lot, you know, children can be very angry when mm. they're very hurt, mm. and I started working with him and now he is in college and he was he receives awards for his behavior his good behavior uh -huh. he, music is his piano is his coping mechanism wow and he doesn't have bodyguards anymore oh, his life wow. has changed wow. it's just, just because we we've studied music enough to study the piano enough to be able to make it happen sit there and play the music mm -hmm. and then he's mm -hmm. When he gets angry, he goes to the piano. <laughs> I wish Let I could it have it. That. I need a piano. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could do that. Yeah. Go for it, yeah. Wow, wow. Listen, uh, it's people like you that make a huge difference in a community. So it wasn't and only And you too. A, well, thank you. But it's not only a pleasure, but it's an honor. And I thank Aww, you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Give my hand. Thank you. Let's give a hand. And when we come back, these messages are second guests. At St. Augustine Distillery, we're part of a new generation of American craft distillers. Family owned and operated, we are committed to making the best possible spirits using local agriculture. Our distillers make everything by hand, from mashing and blending to distilling and tasting each and every batch. We distill and bottle everything we sell, making sure that the spirits are just right before barreling and aging. Bottled by real people, we love showing our guests not only what we do, but why we do it. We're passionate about educating our guests to not only what goes into each bottle, but how to make the best possible cocktails. We love St. Augustine, and thanks to your purchases, we're able to give back to the community and help local organizations each and every day. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your support. St. Augustine Distillery handmade with pride in the nation's oldest city. Hello, I'm Grant Paxton. Welcome to Foxtrot Creative Studio. Let me show you what we do. 
We've been in business for three years now. We can create different graphics for you, um, ads, mailers, flyers, business cards, logos, and even websites. And we're also a printing company as well. So we can create for you the design you need and then the final product. We can usually get you with a design, we can get you a brand new business card in less than two days. US One Computer Works has been serving St. Augustine since 2002. We make repairs on all makes. Is your computer slowing down because of malware and viruses? Bring it to us. And if you can't come to us, we'll come to you. Do you need a wireless network at your business? Problems with your routers? Call US One Computers. We're ready for the task. We're back, ladies and gentlemen, to those messages. And I find myself with Chris Bador. Is that pronounced properly? Like a bow on a door. Yeah, okay. Bador. Bo yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's easy. Uh, just got to visualize it. And uh, for those of you who don't know him, he's uh, one of the many behind the ancient city poets. That's right. And they're here in, in St. Augustine. Uh, I like poetry. Um, I wrote a little when I was in school. And when I discovered that that was that this group, I, I thought it was so interesting. I remember I went once, and yeah, the last uh, year. it was so much fun. Good, I mean, I'm glad you liked it. There was a lot of uh, interesting, um, let's say a festival of verbal activity, but it was very, very, very nice. Yeah. So, Chris, where are you originally from? I'm originally from Connecticut in Fairfield County, uh, uh, Western Connecticut. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you miss the snow? Um, you know, uh, no, <laughs> because I mean, I, I shoveled my fair share of snow, <laughs> and uh, you know, yeah, the minute that snow had fallen, we had to get it all shoveled out, and uh, you know, but moving down here to San Augustine, uh, we have our uh, three months inside right. with the air conditioning, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. up north, you yeah. have your three months uh, with the snow and all, right, and uh, right. I can't say I really like the heat, but yeah. I'm not going to go, uh, you so know, I, I feel it's better to deal with what you're at at yeah. that moment. At that and, moment, yeah. yeah. So, Good philosophy. Yeah. Good, Good survive, uh, for, to, to, to tolerate. Uh, yeah. I, I remember Whatever. the cold uh, and waiting for the train going into funny. work into New York mm -hmm. City and a hole in my boot, uh, and it was just very cold. Uh -oh. At that point, mm -hmm. I wasn't enjoying mm -hmm. the snow, yeah, but, I you know, I just... City, I, I remember cold, cold days, brutal cold days. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to ask you, is basically when you grew up, um, how did poetry get you at the end? I mean, you yeah, start sure. young. What, what yeah. do you think was the, the catalyst, the, the thing that probably... I don't know, it's, it's interesting because I was exposed to it like other people in grade school and right. so forth. And uh, then, uh, you know, I think the sixth grade poetry contest, we had to learn a poem. And so I found a Shel Silverstein poem and tried to memorize it. But, you know, that was tough to do. And then, of course, the, uh, um, uh, the Christmas uh, poem, uh, um, you know, had to memorize that too. The Twist the Night Before Christmas mm -hmm. and all through the house. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but uh, it was all like um, assignments right. and uh, not something that, uh, you know, I was really uh, interested in. Right. Right. And uh, I would say that uh, actually my earliest memory of poetry was uh, I was uh, I found out where the Christmas presents were hidden. And how, how old were you? Yeah, how old were you? Probably, I'm probably like uh, you know a young kid. I knew you know that uh, um, there were other people behind the scenes with Santa Claus <laughs> Santa and all Claus that. Was a, yeah, was I didn't want to do job. any spoiler yeah, yeah, alert, alert for any younger viewers uh -huh. and all that. But uh, so uh, I was down there in the um, laundry room uh, looking around for um, maybe some Christmas presents that hadn't been wrapped up yet, and I came across one of those marble composition notebooks yes. and it was poems that my mom was writing and uh, oh, you know wow. some really um, it's like finding her diary that's it yeah really deep <laughs> stuff and uh, so at that point I you know I kind of viewed my mom a bit differently you know here is a, a poet a, someone you know uh, who is not just a, a mom you, yeah, know. you dress right breakfast on the table you know behave now something you it's yeah. like uh, like someone says 
the two dimensions, suddenly you see that third dimension. That's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I didn't really catch the poetry bug until probably uh, it was uh, college, and uh, I started reading Charles Bukowski, who was the barroom bard, the barroom bar poet. Barfly. Yeah, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, uh, and the movie Barfly had just mm -hmm. come out, and he wrote the screenplay for that, and it was supposed to be like a, a co um, combination of all his uh, sort of short stories and so forth. And mm -hmm. so then I figured, well, you know, if I drink a beer, I could write a poem. And so, uh, so, you, yeah, yeah. so, so you think he signed a, conveyed the message that if you're passionate, anyone could really do this. That's it, because Charles Bukowski's story was that he was a, a mailman first, and he worked at the post office year after year after year. <laughs> then he would punch out and write some poems and so forth. But uh, he was the proof that a working man could be a poet. Mm -hmm. and, and I took that um, mentality with me when I graduated from uh, college and uh, I got a, a job in New York City. I had to ride the train uh, an hour and a half back and forth. So it was three hours on the train. And uh, I thought, okay, well, I can be a, a screenwriter because it was an art school. And so I started to try to write a screenplay. Because you had that commuting time. Yeah, yeah, you know, out. and it was back in the day and um, uh, handwritten with a notepad and so forth. But, you know, uh, one day that um, the screenplay just wasn't flowing and I wrote a poem. And then, and then it happened again like a week later. And a year after that daily train commute, I found like 60 poems in the notebook and uh, you know all these angst ridden 27 year old you know type of things yeah and so I um, um, got into uh, the um, I found out that I could actually type these up uh, it was back in the day when mm -hmm. people were getting computers and my father-in-law had a computer in the house mm -hmm. and then I actually got access to a computer at work and I would type it up during lunch break, type up the poems and format them into a manuscript and I just uh, um, uh, found a, a, a printing press and they published uh, my books and I would... Your first? Yeah. Oh yeah. wow. And then Do you remember was, the title of that book? Oh yeah, yeah. It was... Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Train of thought. Ah, yeah. well, you were all here on the train. <laughs> yeah. It makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you had that senior moment, and then, da, yeah, it came yeah. right in. Check my Got website. Yeah, it check my right website. Yeah. Yeah. It came right in time. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. And so how, how many books are now published that carry your, your poems? Um, there, I, I, I think last count of uh, there is about uh, 12. But what I, I started actually... Um, after I got my poems published by different um, magazines and, and like a lot of the fanzines back then mm -hmm. too, the in, always the independent press, I uh, wanted to, uh, and of course with the poetry readings uh, that came out of uh, this stuff in New York City, I started to put together my um, like anthologies. And so um, they were... Um, First, it, when I started up a reading series in New York City, it was just an opportunity for me to uh, read my poems out loud, okay. you know. And right. then it happened to be at my brother's, uh, um, first, he, was, he had a coffee shop down mm -hmm. in New York City, and so uh, the people who were doing the poetry, uh, they had a disagreement, and they're like, they're like, Chris, you write poems. So my brother invited me to do a every other Thursday poetry reading at his place. Yes, and I was like, saying. you know, how can I do mm -hmm. this kind mm -hmm. of thing? Mm -hmm. And uh, they just put the mic mm -hmm. in front of me and uh, I started inviting other people to the right. open mic and people would walk by at the open door, turn around and come in, sign up on the list. And awesome. so, yeah, it went on for like a year and a half way back when uh -huh. it was the alt dot uh, poetry series. Uh -huh. It was uh, Alt Dot Co uh, Coffee was the name of the place, and mm. so you know we just had a year and a half every other wow. Thursday poetry series. Right, right. So I put out a self-published anthology of all the people who had read right, at right. that reading. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my, my first yeah. experience of poetry was uh, Spanish Romanticism, Adolfo Becker. Okay. And he write these very passionate, uh, uh, beautiful, I think. And I think when I I got older it was Pablo Neruda. 
Okay. And uh, sure. I had a, I have an ex-girlfriend that she was learning Spanish, and and we one of our favorite times I think was reading these these poems, and she'd read them in Spanish because phonetically she could read. Okay. She didn't understand, but she could read. Mm -hmm. and some words she could identify. Then on the other side it was in English, and then I would read it in English. And uh, it, it was so, I think it was one, one of my favorite moments with her was reading, because it was me also going back to discover Pablo Neruda. But how did you start this ancient city poet here? Okay, how did so, that come yeah, to be? well, fast forward. Uh, my wife and I, we always knew that we were going to retire to St. Augustine and, and, and work, you know, that commute in New York City, uh, we knew it wasn't going to last too <laughs> long. And sure enough, it, it went for 10 out. years. It wears you out. And uh, Twin Towers came down, oh. and that was a bad Tuesday at work oh. for me, you know? Oh. And it's just like, okay, you know, we, uh, and just keep on going to work every day on 23rd Street. Wow. And, uh, you know, the city, you know, the city pulled together. It was mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when all the planets aligned and we were able to move down here, uh, that was about uh, two years later. Okay. So, you know, Why St. Augustine? Um, we had family down okay. here, and, and my wife and I, as a young couple, mm -hmm. we would come down and okay. uh, vacation you, you down knew, here. You the area. Yeah, so we you know, got to know the, know the area, and uh, sure enough, like I said, all the um, cards lined up, all the planets lined up, and so forth. And when we made the move down here, it was like, you know, I was left a job that I had had for 10 years, and uh, um, wasn't sure what the next stage was going to be mm -hmm. in my life, um, but the, the cultural council, uh, which is pretty, at, you know, very active here in town, I mm -hmm. found out about them, and so I told them about my poetry projects and so forth. And uh, got they had little networking things like Anne Craft. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. She was one of the first council, council, people yes. I met, and Tommy Bledsoe mm -hmm. and Joy Delia. Wow. And they're just yeah. uh, and, la crème de la crème, monsieur. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, they were all very supportive of the arts and right. so forth. And uh, then um, I was told that there was an interest for poetry, but it was really Glenda Bailey Marchand. Uh, asked uh, for all the poets and writers to get together for a uh, um, National Poetry Month right. observation, and that's right. in um, April. Mm -hmm. And so that was back in 2009. Okay. And so uh, I said, well, I know uh, how to do an open mic, and so I offered to do right. that. And so we did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did it on San Marco at the Cultural Council's office at the, mm -hmm. at the time. And it had a fantastic turnout. And then Glenda Bailey Marchand did one two weeks later in April and uh, had like uh, different people attending it and so forth. And then uh, when August rolled around, um, my wife, Mary Beth, she was saying, you know, why don't you do an open mic like you used to do in New York City? And right. so we said, well, we got to find a place to do it. And, wow. and we uh, approached uh, one place that was totally into us. And, so we launched the Ancient City Poets mm -hmm. in August of 2009. Wow. The name actually came from Glenda Bailey Marchand. She used it in April, and I was like, do you mind if I take it and run with it? And she's like, yeah, absolutely, awesome. more power to you. So how many poets do you have in this group now? It, it's really, um, we have the sign-up sheet, mm -hmm. and uh, you sign in, you uh, get up when the spirit moves, and you read, and we all, n always have like 15 people. When do you uh, people. meet? When do you meet? Last Sunday of every month. Last Sunday of every month. Yeah. And where? Right now we're at the Corazon Theater, oh, which a, is the best that's place a great that place. we've ever been. That is yeah. a great place. And I say best because um, it's catered to performances mm -hmm. and the way it's mm -hmm. designed and so forth. The first forth. season was all yeah. done there. Absolutely. The tonight show. Yeah. But I mean, in your monologue, you're talking about like, you know, in like the bar area and, and how things are quiet mm -hmm. when you, well, well, we've been doing poetry readings in coffee shops for many, many years, oh. and you have the um, different steamed milk oh. and drinks and the blender and all that. <laughs> um, yeah, uh -huh. but that's a fascinating thing to bring poetry into that atmosphere yeah. where people um, are just going to order coffee and leave and then they decide to stay mm -hmm. because of the um, culture that they're being mm -hmm. exposed to. Now, so. you're having some poems that were uh, now uh, translated in Polish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's awesome. It is, um, because with this network that I've developed over the years of publishing other people and the mm -hmm. anthologies and so forth, 
um, just one thing led to another, right. and, uh, um, and of course the international aspect with uh, email and the internet yeah. now. All I mean, social thing is yeah, crazy. I started way back when we were writing letters to people <laughs> and postcards. And, yeah, and letters. absolutely. But uh, they uh, asked me f to send some poems, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and then they said they wanted to translate it and put the uh, English right on like one my Neruda side. book. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh -huh. And so I just got a. Um, text today that they're going to send me a copy of the book That's and so awesome. this is you know a, a, a publisher in Poland who's published me with eight other uh, poets uh -huh. and the, the five poems are, will be presented in English and also translated right. into Polish. So, Talking about yeah. books, what could you tell me about this? Yeah, that's um, a literary magazine. What's, it, that, what's the title of that? AC Papa. What, what does that mean? It means Ancient City Poets uh -huh. and uh, authors and uh, poets and authors. Uh, that's okay. right. Yeah, photographers. <laughs> uh huh. Yes. Yes. It's lovely. If I yeah. wanted to get this, where would I get it? Could I find uh, it on Amazon? You can, uh, you can find it on Amazon. Absolutely. Yeah. AC Papa, and it's all these local poets. Yeah. And there's photographs also, yeah. and uh, they're so cool because um, some of them are talking about selling a house or talking about the nature in our area. I mean, they all have so many yeah. different themes. Um, I, I went through it the other night and I loved it. I really yeah, did. Yeah. I loved yeah. it. And I loved what you said there, talking about snow, how uh, the leaves are now the snow That's for it. you. And he has a little editor's um, sure. a prologue or whatever. And uh, it, it was very nice. But yeah. I love that fact. Your oak trees now give you enough leaves that they become like your snow now. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I thank you so much. We've ran out of time, and okay. um, uh, it's, it's awesome. I think it's awesome to have something related to poetry that people can go, and, and people are invited to go and, and, and listen or yeah, join and, or and read a poem. Even if it's your first poem, sixth grade, you know, go ahead. That's you know. it, because it's a community open mic, That's and it. uh, it's an opportunity for uh, the more seasoned people to give back to the people who are new and starting out. And that's where I was 20, 25 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give him a hand. I thank you so much. Thanks. After these messages, we'll be back with Mr. Buchanan. Woo! Billy Buchanan. Hi, my name is Dana. I own Sweet City Cupcakes, and we're located at 233 West King Street. We specialize in custom cakes and cupcakes. We use fresh and local ingredients and bake fresh daily. Uh, each of our cupcakes is decorated with a unique look to complement the flavor. Uh, we have signature cupcakes such as the Marilyn, the Elvis, the I Love Lucy. Uh, we have a unique vintage look. Stop in and say hello. Have a cup of coffee and a delicious cupcake. Even better yet, take a box home to share with the family. Our ingredients are mostly natural. It's palm oil, coconut oil, olive oil. Uh, we put cocoa butter, shea butter, and real silk in our soaps. Also, it's something that's pleasing to the eye and you, you enjoy using it. Come visit us at Antoinette's Bathhouse. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back with Billy Buchanan. And you know, that's the kind of name uh, that, yeah, you pronounce it Buchanan. Buchanan. Yeah, a lot of people say Buchanan. No, you so. say that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but I have, you know so what? So your publicist said, pronounce his name correctly. Buchanan. Okay. Exactly. Like, like your 15th president. Uh, oh, all right. Yeah, that's right. 
and the 16th was really famous. Right. Yes. That's why nobody knows the 15th president. Right. Exactly. Uh, the pre-show. <laughs> and so, uh, tell me. So, what's home for you? Where did you? Where did Born you? Born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland. Okay. Best place in the world to grow up, man. Really? Because? It's just it was just a nice family town. People don't look at Cleveland that way, but uh -huh. there's a lot of suburbs. It's pretty spread out. Yeah, they used to make a lot of jokes about Cleveland. Do they still make jokes about Cleveland? Well, I don't know. I think some cities now have... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, we got LeBron there, so it's better. Yes, you know so I mean? that's what I'm saying. But it's... We have the Indians. Whoa, whoa, yeah, whoa. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it was a great town okay. to grow up in. And um, I just, you know, you know how it is, man. I guess everybody says yeah. that about the town they grew up in. Right. For, and, for and me, you, it was awesome. And, and for you, uh, the instrument you play, what's the instrument you play that you would say is your main instrument? Well, honestly, mm -hmm. I feel like bass is my first instrument. Huh. Yeah, even though I don't play it a lot anymore. Right. Um, I still, you know, whenever I'm, you know, working on a record or whatever, I, I still play all the bass on it. And I'll still get hired periodically, but I play acoustic and, and electric live okay. most of the time. But bass is what I studied in college. and. It's weird, oh, I know, but I mean, I, I, I've always considered myself yeah. a bass player first. I love you know? bass because I like yeah. funk. I like Curtis Mayfield. Exactly. You know, where Dude, don't get me started, boom, boom, man. You know, Dude, I was saying right. that to Elizabeth Roth because she went from guitar to bass. Yeah, she's it's interesting bad. that I bass to, to guitar. Yeah. And what do you like about the guitar? Um, for me, it was the easiest instrument to write music with. Mm. I wasn't I a hear piano. that a lot. Yeah, yeah I wasn't a piano. I, mean, I, can, I can play piano enough to get myself in trouble. My, my mom's a piano player. Okay. So, but guitar for me was always easy to be able to. You know, play chords mm -hmm. and write my melodies and all that. So it just, I gravitated toward it, mm -hmm. you know. Was there music at home? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My mom, all my uncles and my granddad, and it was always there. Well, the yeah. guitar you use has a, a little history. It's a great to it. story. That guitar right there. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yes. You'll see um, it when he plays. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, um, that's an early 70s Univox guitar. Don't touch it now. Be careful. <laughs> what are you doing? Nobody's, wow, man. I'm not going to play it. No, no. Show it to the audience. There you go, people. There you go. All right, yeah. put it back. Be careful. Yes, yes I will. Costs a lot of money. <laughs> okay, here I am. You look and, rich. And what's though, the, so you might get to pay for it. What's the uh, what, what's the what's the, the history? Story? Yes, behind that guitar. Yeah, that um, guitar belonged to my great uncle. So that's my granddad's little brother, my uncle Lonnie. Um, he died in the mid '70s, but he used to play guitar for Sam Cooke and Lloyd Price and a bunch of like rock and roll Hall yeah. of Famers, like yeah. literally. Yeah. And um. He was a great guitar player, but he died early. He died in his early 40s. He got, you know, he, was, he lived in New York and just got in mm. that whole scene That's in the 70s and all that. a terrible city. But my second cousin, um, his son, hit me up about three or four years ago, and he said, man, I've got all my dad's stuff. He said, I see you on Facebook. You play, and you, you're really uh -huh. doing it and the whole deal. And he's like, I don't know how to play this, these instruments, man. He said, if you can get up to Cleveland, I'll give you one of his guitars. And, he, and I said, well, send me a picture. I thought he was kidding around, you know. And he sends me the picture of that. I said, dude. <laughs> so I, it's funny, I called another one of my cousins who is actually on my dad's side of the family, who mm -hmm. was actually coming down to Atlanta for, for some reason. And I said, hey, man, I'll meet you in Atlanta um, if you will go and get this guitar from my, my cousin on right. my mom's side of the family. You go get this guitar and bring it down to me. So mm -hmm. I met him in Atlanta, and he gave it to me, and I've been playing it ever since. It's, wow. bad. it's a bad guitar, wow. man. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, Even though I can't really play it that well, I, I look good with it. Oh, uh, yeah. You know what I mean? I look real good with it, you know? Musician it looks amazing modesty, in a photo I shoot, too. Modesty. Oh, I can't really play. I can't really play. So, so here, how long have you been in this, this area here of St. Augustine? I moved here in 2007, so 10 years. Oh, wow. And yeah. you live in St. Augustine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. And Love you have a family. family. Oh, yeah. Yeah? How many oh. children? Three. Oh, wow. Three kids. My, gonna, my oldest just got married, actually. Oh my! Like Lord. three weeks ago, I know. There, there's a logical. Black don't crack, people. Well, yeah. There's, um. there's a there's a there, there's a logical <laughs> question for that, but we're not going to go into, into age. Uh, uh, it, it was so funny. Woody Allen used to say that they, they found my wife's foot at the Natural Museum of of history in New York, and they were able to build a whole dinosaur from that tree. Wow. Uh, 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 he was divorced by then. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's funny. But oh wow! So pretty. Pretty soon you could be a granddad. Dude! Oh, well, you know. Oh. Just, just, just. oh, you'll love it. You're I, getting I, way I have, too I real have, for me right uh, now, man. So, so what, what is your opinion of the, of, the, of the music scene here in St. Augustine? You know, when I moved here, um, I, I lived in Nashville for about almost nine years. I, I mm -hmm. was signed to EMI there, and I was with another band, and, and did that whole deal. I've toured all over the world and played with tons of people. Mm -hmm and was living the dream. I mean, literally doing everything that I had set out to do, you know? Okay. And um, when I moved here, 
I had been on the road about 300 dates a year for about eight years. Wow. Family was falling uh, apart. That's what I was going to say. It was, hard it was rough. Family. It was really, really tough. And um, so I moved here to kind of get my, my, my balance again mm -hmm. a little bit and, and just trying to figure it out again and say, okay, well, ah, there's got to be a better way than this, you know? Right. I still wanted to play music, of course, but I just I wanted to figure out another way to do it. So I moved here. I actually took a job at a church. Actually, that's where I first met Annette. Is she still here? Yeah, here she is. She's that's somewhere. actually where I first met her. Uh -huh. um, took a job at a church here in town and was the music director there for a while. So I was able to still do music, right. but I didn't have to be on the road all the time, right? right? And right. I was still, I was still um, touring a little bit, but it, wasn't not, it was nothing like what I had mm -hmm, been doing, okay? Mm -hmm. But then I realized it was such a scene here. I didn't know. I had no idea. Really? So I had no idea. So I started going to hang out at some of the venues and stuff. And, and the first venue here in town to hire me was the Milltop. Okay. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I, I walked in there, and Don, I don't know if you know Don, but... No. He's the older guy. I think they're about to open back up. I was just talking to my bass player. Yeah, they're rebuilding yeah, right. that, whole, that and, whole building. And Don's still there, I think. But I, he, I walked in there, and I had a little dreads at the time and all this. And he's <laughs> like, oh, was this little black guy coming in here, you know? And I said, hey, man, I said, can I, can I just play a song? And so I played a, a Bill Withers tune. I played Ain't No Sunshine. I just uh, picked with an acoustic guitar, and I played it for no him. Sunshine. And he hired me. Go ahead, man. No, do, no. I mean, no, I do it. <laughs> do it. I love that song. <laughs> I love that song. I love that it, song. It is arguably the best song ever written. You think? Arguably the best song ever okay. written, man. All right. You know what was his first hit? How do was you come it? out of the gate with that? I know. What was his second? I'm trying to think oh, he's, his he's second had, hit. He's had, you know, that second. Lean On Me. Lean Those On Me. Those two songs alone, he could have retired. Oh, we would TV. hear that on the radio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in, Don't get me started. Over and over. He's, yeah. He's, he's awesome. one of my cats, man. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So here's the... Uh, I could quite possibly so, have his baby. Okay, since we're on that. No, but since we're on that, who do you think influenced you when you were... Getting oh, into there's music. tons of guys, man. Let me finish my story about St. Augustine real fast. Okay. <laughs> You're one of those guys. You're, you're kind of like an ADD guy like me. Uh -huh, right? You just uh -huh. kind of, uh -huh. pretty bird, uh -huh. pretty bird. Go, <laughs> go where it takes you. <laughs> go where it takes you. Um, so I played that song for him. He was like, wow. And he's like, can I, he booked me immediately. I hadn't played any, anywhere here in town. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's kind of where it started for me. Then I started playing, um, you know, I just, he, the word got around. So I started doing his little solo dates around and stuff. And. You were playing alone. Just solo. alone, no band. Okay. You know, I, even though I had been doing that again in right. Nashville, I had done. I had seriously, man, ten thousand seat venues. I mean, wow. I've toured with some pretty major cats, and but I got here, man, and just really started over. Wow. I didn't really tell a lot of people about my history. I just right. kind of went in and yeah. humbled myself a little bit, and just kind of started over. And mm -hmm. um, and the one thing I always tell people about this town is that it really helped me find my musical voice. Okay. Oh, no doubt. Now we can get back to what you were asking in a uh -huh, second. Uh -huh. I, really, I really feel like, because in Nashville, I was doing what everybody else wanted me to do, and I was playing everybody else's music or playing behind other people, whatever. But I really feel like when I got here, I said, okay, what is the music you love? Okay. What are you good at? Right. What do people love to hear from you? Okay. You know, so I started, I, when I first started playing the senior, I was playing everything. I mean, anything that was on the radio, I'd play it. <laughs> but I started kind of narrowing it down. I was like, ah, you know what? That Keith Urban song is cool, but it's not really my bag. Uh huh, uh huh. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Let's just take that out of the repertoire. And I really started getting down to my cats, the Otis Reddings and the Sam Cooks mm. and the Wilson Pickets. That's such and a all great the, era. Oh, that's, that's the, whenever I would do those tunes, I'd drop in the dock of the bay. Everybody was paying uh, attention, you know, it's like, okay, there's something to this, you know. And then come, started thinking about it. The reason that is because that's the music that was in my house. My mom and my dad, my grandparents, all they played was all that 50s and 60s soul mm -hmm. stuff and early mm -hmm. rock stuff. Mm -hmm. So now it's the best stuff, man. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you say? Keep them coming. Keep you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Even doo wop. I remember all that stuff, man. The I, drifters, I the platters, yes. all that music, man. Only That's the you. This guy. <laughs> that is awesome. You want to sing, don't awesome. you, man? No, no, no. You no, want to no. sing, don't you? No, no, Come no, on, no, dude. No, you want no, those guys? Come I'm, on, man. I'm Go ancient. Ahead. No, but, but so. So that's I the music that was in my household. Right. But you know, I'm a child of the '80s. You know, so Prince was my guy. I was going to ask you. About that. He's the guy. He's the reason why I picked up the guitar. Literally, the reason. I remember seeing the video for Little Roy Corvette, and I said, "Holy cow." I don't know what it is that dude's doing, but I want that, you know? Uh -huh. I had already been singing and stuff, but uh -huh. guitar, he's the reason I picked up the guitar. Wow. And, I, and Purple Rain was the first song I ever wow. learned how to play on the guitar. Wow. And to this day, I still play it at the yeah. end of my shows and stuff. And to me, he yeah. was his own genre of oh, music. Ridiculous, man. He, he, yeah, he was a, a, a reincarnation of Little Richard. Everybody. In a way. But he That's was funny you say genre. that. My mom said this to me when I was a kid. She goes, boy, 
he ain't nothing but Little Richard and Jimi Hendrix and Sly Stone and James Brown put together. <laughs> That's what she said to me. And she was right on point, right? And I was like, oh, you so don't know what you're it. talking about, man. Uh, but he, she was right on the money. Yeah. Now, now you're older and you say, yeah, no she was right on the money. Yeah. Oh, wow, wow. No doubt. Yeah. So, so what do you see the future for you Me? in music? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I kind of consider myself these days the ambassador of rock and soul. Hmm. That's what I consider myself. I feel like my calling is to keep this music alive. Because mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of black guys. I'm going to be honest mm -hmm. with you. I don't yeah, see yeah. a lot of young black men who really understand that the Bruno Marses and the Kendrick Lamars wouldn't exist without the Little Richards mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. Ray Charleses yeah. and the Chuck Berries. Those mm -hmm. cats started all of this, man. Mm -hmm. So I really feel like that's what I love to do. I love that music. So now, man, I surround myself with it. I play it. I talk about it. All my original stuff is very influenced mm -hmm. by it. But that's and what Mick Jagger said. He said, we just took your black music that yeah. you were having this issue about. Yeah. We took it. Oh, in England? And right. sold it right and, back, and back to you. It's so true. It's ridiculous. And you go, that, that's literally what happened. Uh, the, the Rolling Stones got, yeah. got started. That, so that's true. That's so interesting. But you know what? When those cats broke, though, the muddy waters of the world and all those artists, they, their popularity started getting big again yes. because all these British artists appreciated them. Yes. Whereas in America, we had yeah. forgotten yeah. about them. Look you know? at jazz. Jazz yeah, made exact, it huge exactly. on the other side Same of the water. Thing. Yeah. And here it's hard to find a good jazz venue. That's right. It's, it's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. And so when Prince died, yeah, that was... Uh, that was the worst day ever for me. That was, I remember I was in a meeting with my manager at the time, and, and literally my phone blew up. Literally. Wow. I was like, what is going on? And then my boy, Hector, who's drummer, he's like, uh -huh. yeah, all I said is, dude, Prince is dead. I thought he was joking, man. Right, right, right. And of course I went, I was like, I just kind of... Right, she was right. like, oh, this meeting's over, yeah, you know, because, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was done. It's, yeah, yeah you can't. So who's in your band right now? Call it Man, the, those, it's, the, the, it's my Rock and Soul, soul review. review. Again, it's a nod to that era. You right. know, a lot of the, you know, James Brown had a review, mm -hmm. and a lot of those bands had reviews, you know. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and usually, honestly, it's bigger than this. I'll have more horns. I'm a female mm -hmm. singer, but it's a little stage, but I can't bring everybody in here, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I have a kind of a revolving door of musicians, man. I purposely do that. I try to um, keep some great caliber musicians around me, and they're, mm -hmm. And because they're so good, they're busy. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, if you're good, you're playing. Right. I, I expect that. You know, mm -hmm. so I try to keep three or four bass players in my, my back pocket right. or three or four drummers, and right. I, I call on the best guys, Smart. man, you know, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and they, I make them learn my music. Okay. And if they mess up, they get fined $50, like James Brown. <laughs> That's what he used to do. Did you know that? He would look at his players and be like, hey, <laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> we go right back to this thing. The hardest man <laughs> in showbiz. The hardest, hardest working, working man in showbiz. In, 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 isn't it? Yeah, he was bad. And, and um, what was I going to ask? Oh, wow. You know, when you get old like me, the, the questions just suddenly leave you. But uh, I was, I was going to say, if you were on, a, on an island and you could One only album? listen. I know the answer to that easy. Really? Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life. Wow. Done. That is such a complete album. Ugh. This you is don't like, need anything else in your life. But yeah, that if record. you could only listen to something from album, Stevie, right? that so album like, uh, gives you everything, everything you need to know about yes, him. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, the words, the writing, the musicianship, it rocks, it funks, it reggae's, it yes. does everything. It man. does everything, yeah. yeah. It's a He's great amazing. record. Yeah. Could you play something for us? Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When we come back, <laughs> Mr. Billy Buchanan, the Rock and Soul Review. <laughs>
Thanks for our guests and to Billy. Uh, it was just awesome. Thank you very much.